Bisa saya mulai, Ibu? Yes, yes, please, Belinda. Oke, okay, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Belinda, and I will be hosting the seminar today. On behalf of the organizers, I would like to extend, extend my warm Welcome to the Dean of the Faculty of Law Brawijaya University, Dr. Muhammad Ali Safaat, and the distinguished speakers. First, Professor Petri Kaiser, second, Associate Professor Dr. Sony Zulhuda, and Dr. Sukarmi SHM Hum. I also welcome all participants who attend this international seminar. Omnibus Law in Indonesia, a comparative study with other countries, which is organized by the Faculty of Law, Brawijaya University. Ladies and gentlemen, on this occasion, I would like to inform you the agenda of the event, the opening ceremony by Dr. Muhammad Ali Safaat, the Dean of the Faculty of Law, Brawijaya University, followed by the presentation that will be delivered by the four speakers, After that, we will open a question and answer session, which will be led by the moderator, Mrs. Prisca Listening Room SHLLM. Ladies and gentlemen, to begin with, I would like to invite Dr. Muhammad Ali Safaat, the Dean of the Faculty of Law, Brawijaya University, to deliver his opening remark. Please welcome. Okay, uh, dear distinguished speakers, Profesor Patrick Kaiser, Associate Professor Dr. Sony Zulhuda, Ibu Dr. Sukarmi, and all of the participant of this international seminar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and alhamdulillah, thanks to God that uh, for our health, so we can meet virtually in this international seminar. Uh, with topic uh, very interesting omnibus law in Indonesia and at the 2nd of November 2020 President Jokowi has promulgated job creation act that reacted by demonstration in many cities in, in all of Indonesian region uh, thousands of university students and labor expresses their disagreement for the acts during pandemic situation. And I think almost 6,000 demonstrants were arrested and maybe 240 of them will be brought to the court. And of course, this is not the end of the story because there are many petitions to the constitutional court concerning this act. And this act itself needs many government regulation to implement. Uh, actually, omnibus law as a method is not entirely new in Indonesia, but as an act that changed 79 diverse acts uh, on 1,184 pages and proceed within less than one year, it's totally new in Indonesia. We hope uh, this international seminar enrich our perspective in analyzing uh, this phenomenon, this Job Creation Act. And I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Patrick Kaiser, Associate Professor Dr. Sonny Zulhuda and Ibu Dr. Sukarmi for your willingness to become speaker in this international seminar. And also thank you for all the participants and committee for organizing this international seminar. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad Ali Safaat. Now it is time for the seminar presentation that will be delivered by our distinguished speakers. This presentation session, which will be chaired by Mrs. Priska Listening Room SHLLM. Without further ado, please welcome Mrs. Priska Listening Room SHLLM. Well, thank you very much, uh, Belinda. So. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, in Indonesia, and also good evening for Professor Patrick in Melbourne. 
Uh, so today uh, we are going to have an international seminar on omnibus law, uh, particularly the omnibus law on the job creations. And we are going to have a comparative uh, learning from two countries, uh, which are Australia and Malaysia. So as the Dean already thought uh, later that the omnibus law is a very hot issue among the Indonesian lawyers and legal scholars today because at the beginning of this month, uh, to be exact, on Monday to November 2020, the Indonesian government under the presidency of Joko Widodo has just signed an omnibus law on the job creation. Now the law is registered as law number 11, year 2020. The law itself consists of 15 chapters and 186 articles. It regulates a wide range of issues from the environment to the uh, employment. And also uh, it changes uh, several verse and uh, concepts in others, if I'm not mistaken, 76 laws. So, it should be very complicated because in concept, the use of omnibus law itself has not been accommodated by the legislation making law, law number 12, year 2011, even though the use of this concept is neither wrong nor prohibited. So there is a status quo here. Uh, another problem is also arises because the creations of the omnibus law on the job creations is considered as untransparent, not transparent, and also doesn't go through a proper process of public discussions. So without having more introductions, uh, we are going to open our discussion by having our distinguished speaker from Australia, uh, Professor Patrick Kayser. He is the Research Chair of Law and Public Policy at Latrobe University and also an expert on constitutional law. And after that, we are going to move to the second speaker, which is Dr. Sodi Zulhuda from International Islamic University in Malaysia. Then will be continued by Dr. Muhammad Ali Safaat. Uh, the Dean of Law Faculty, and also an expert on Indonesian constitutional law. Then the last but not the least, we will have a thought-provoking presentation from Dr. Sukarmi SHMH, the Head of Law Study Program, that will share us her thought on omnibus law in economic law perspective. So uh, for the first, I'm going to please Professor Pratik Kaiser to uh, deliver her speech, maybe for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, I please you, Professor Patrick. Thank you very much. And um, uh, greetings to all of you. Um, Salamat pagi. And uh, because it's late afternoon here in, um, in Melbourne. Um, I hope you can all see the um, slides that I'm sharing from my computer. Um, so um, let me just hold on a second. Wait a second. Uh, let me go to the next slide. Okay, I hope that you can all see that second slide that says uh, the omnibus law. And I'm starting my presentation. Do you, have you, can you see the slide? No? Not yet. It was. Okay. Let's, it was, yes. let's yes. try that again. Um, let's try that again. It, it appeared before, and then you said you, you went to the next slide, then it disappeared. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Professor. Um, right. okay, yes, yeah. it's there. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. You can okay. see that. Um, let's just make it a bit bigger so people can see it. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. How's that? All right. Perfect. Yeah, 
Fantastic. Yes, thank, you right. thank you. Thank you for your patience. Okay, so um, I've start starting my presentation with a definition uh, that actually comes from a Canadian paper um, about omnibus laws. And in that paper, uh, the concept of an omnibus law was defined as a law that seeks to amend, repeal or enact several laws and is characterised by the fact that it has a number of related um, but distinctive initiatives. And um, uh, uh, Ibu Prisha has already drawn attention to the fact that the new omnibus law in Indonesia is very long, uh, that it has uh, many chapters and uh, amends, um, uh, I've seen different reports, but some reports have said 76 laws, others have said 70 or 73. So uh, we can certainly feel confident that it's a large number of laws that are being amended. So the new law certainly qualifies as an omnibus law if you look at international definitions. And uh, the government has said that the law is designed to implement a national policy of increasing economic growth, uh, and in particular, uh, attracting international investment. Um, and I think part of the rationale for the new law, uh, according to the government, is um, some concerns that have been expressed uh, that uh, business compliance and regulation in Indonesia is uh, compl complicated. Uh, and in making that observation, I'm not um, criticising Indonesia uh, because personally I've always found Indonesia a wonderful place to visit uh, and I've never had any difficulty conducting business there. However, this is the impression uh, that some international agencies and international businesses have. And so the government decided that they would engage in a large reform effort to um, streamline business uh, licensing processes and the like uh, for, for international investors. Um, and, and certainly the reception uh, of the omnibus law amongst uh, international um, uh, observers has been, generally speaking, uh, very positive. It's seen as a breakthrough um, uh, because it is... is simplified um, the law. So let's firstly start talk uh, my discussion about the positives, about, the, about the, the reasons why governments would engage in omnibus uh, legal reforms. Well, it's, it's, it's a good technique to use when you want to engage in comprehensive reform. Um, so, um, and it's particularly useful in federal systems so um, uh, Ind Indonesia, of course, is, um, has national laws, uh, it has provincial uh, laws, and it has local laws. So it, there, are, there are many layers of um, law in, um, in Indonesia. Um, and of course, there are decisions of courts, there are, there are regulations, and there's legislation. So it is a complicated system. Um, and I know Australia is also a complicated uh, system, although Australia has a much smaller population. It also has a federal system of government. Uh, and what that means is that you can have uh, smaller parliaments and legislatures um, uh, making laws, local laws, uh, and then you have the national government making the national laws. And in Australia, there are many examples of omnibus laws being passed. So for example, in about 10 years ago, uh, the Australian government passed an omnibus law on personal property securities. Um, so this is the law that applies in Australia um, in circumstances where you are um, seeking to um, borrow money uh, on the strength of an asset that's personal property, so not not a um, not not immovable property like land, but movable property. And as a civil law country, you'd be familiar with the distinction between movable property and immovable property. The Personal Property Securities Act is about borrowing money using movable property as assets, and that piece of legislation uh, replaced about 180 
pieces of legislation. So uh, you can see that things were very complex before the omnibus law came into place. And I think it's important to appreciate that, uh, you know, a significant, um, uh, a significant positive benefit of law reform uh, is, is what you have afterwards. You have that simplification. Australia has also had local state-based um, civil procedure rules. We now have an omnibus piece of legislation called the Universal Civil Procedure Rules. We also have a Uniform Evidence Act, and we also have the Australian Consumer Law, which, you know, we used to have different uh, consumer law sections, legislation in every state and territory of Australia, and there are eight. So all of the legislation from those eight states and territories has now been replaced with a single piece of national legislation. So Australia has had uh, many circumstances where we, have, um, where we have engaged in omnibus legal reforms. I will make this observation though, sometimes the consultation that preceded the development of these omnibus laws lasted for years and years and years before something changed. So it certainly wasn't a um, eight month uh, short um, uh, consultation period. Now, the next observation I'd make about omnibus laws is that they can also be negative. And, uh, and I was just making this point a moment ago. Sometimes um, when a government is engaged in a reform effort, it wants to do it quickly. And so the, the amount of time it spends uh, consulting with the public or trade unions or government officials uh, can be short. And, um, you know, every, every country is different and every situation is different. So um, I don't know whether eight months was long enough for the omnibus law, but it may well have been. Um, I, I guess that's going to be something uh, that you'll be able to observe in the realm of politics. Um, if you do have a short period of time for consultation, there is the, uh, the risk that um, opportunities to review successive drafts of the legislation can be limited. Uh, there is always the possibility that environmental or social harms may not be considered. After all, who stands up for the environment? Obviously, trade unions will stand up for workers, but when it comes to the environment, a tree cannot stand up for itself. So you really have to rely on those environmental groups, those um, environmental interest groups in society to stand up on behalf of um, the environment. Uh, and sometimes when you want um, fast paced economic reform, uh, there can be environmental concerns. Um, there's also the danger that if you are determined to reform something, then you may not be really be interested in having people scrutinize your reform proposals. And finally, the sheer volume of, of reforms uh, can make meaningful scrutiny difficult and maybe even impossible. So these are um, the, the criticisms that can and have been made of the practice of omnibus laws in other countries. Uh, and I'm sharing them with you in this slide. I think it's important when we're balancing up the positives and the negatives of an omnibus law is that right now, uh, because we're all lawyers uh, and we are familiar with the 76 laws uh, that are all being replaced by the omnibus law, right now the picture seems very complicated for us. And we're thinking, how is this going to work? How is How, how are these 76 laws and the many experts that we have on these laws, how are they going to, you know, be able to advise people in this brave new world where there's just one law? Um, and, and, and of course, this is what happens in, in a democracy like Indonesia. Um, you know, it, legislation is made and it's sometimes hard for us to imagine what life will be like after we get rid of the 76 laws and only have one. But it's really important to make this observation, nothing is permanent, okay? So maybe the omnibus law comes in, uh, you know, now um, and it starts to operate and so on and so forth, but that doesn't mean that the, the legis legislature or the president can come back and say, okay, well, this part of it is working well, but this other part of it may not be working well. And that's the, the wonderful thing about democracy um, I've been visiting Indonesia for 25 years, and so I've seen big changes in how Indonesia conducts its business. And 
every time I come to Indonesia, it is more democratic. There are more interest groups expressing their views. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing. So politics is very alive and very healthy in Indonesia. So I'm confident that although some people may have concerns about the omnibus law right now, these concerns can be addressed in political fora. They can be addressed in the realm of politics. And of course, you know, in three or four years, uh, President Jokowi will be, um, you know, there will be other people who will want to be president. Uh, and they will have a political point of view and maybe they will have a different view about the omnibus law. We don't know. Uh, but isn't it wonderful that we're in a demo democracy and that we can have those opinions, express those opinions and, uh, and remember that nothing is permanent. I mean, personally, uh, in my 25 years of visiting Indonesia, I've seen enormous change. And I'm sure everybody on this uh, Zoom call would agree that there has been enormous change in Indonesia in the last 25 years. Well, what will happen in the next three years, five years, 10 years? Uh, only time will tell. But the wonderful thing about democracy is we can keep on lobbying for change. So if the omnibus law doesn't work out, then I'm confident that Indonesia will work out a superior alternative. So that's my uh, presentation. And um, I'm happy to take questions if there are any, or if Miss uh, Prisha would like others to speak, that's fine too. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Patrick, uh, for a very thought-provoking and mind-blowing thought on the issue. Because uh, it is pro cons that uh, is it a good uh, method of lawmaking process or it is just something that will ruin everything. But uh, as you share about uh, Australian perspective, so uh, it then becoming a new um, insight for us that other countries also applies it, but maybe with something that I can call it proper maybe about the consultation you mentioned that it it, it takes years not only eight months consultations uh, I think it is an interesting point that maybe now why Indonesian legal scholars are very angry because this law is without a proper consultation so for the participants if you have any questions to Professor Patrick you can just type it on the chat box and maybe after the second speaker after Professor uh, after Dr Sony I will let uh, Professor Patrick to answer some questions if there. Jadi untuk Bapak Ibu yang saat ini mengikuti seminar ini kalau ada pertanyaan yang akan ditujukan kepada Prof Patrick Silakan disampaikan di uh, chat box. Uh, nanti setelah uh, pemateri yang kedua, setelah Bapak Dr. Sony, Prof. Patrick akan saya persilahkan untuk menjawab pertanyaan Anda. So now maybe with, uh, while waiting for questions, we are moving to the second speaker, which is uh, Dr. Sony Zulhuda, uh, Associate Professor at the Ahmad Ibrahim Kuliah of Laws, Law Faculty is International Islamic University Malaysia that is going to talk about the Malaysian experience on omnibus law. So the time is yours, Dr. Sony. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ibu Priska. Now, uh, let me now set uh, this slide. Can you now see my screen? Um, yes, it is clearly, yeah. All right, thank you. Just one second. Um, sorry. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good afternoon. Selamat siang. Uh, dan mungkin selamat sore for people at the at different time zones and I noticed Prof. Patrick also mentions it is late afternoon back in Melbourne. So uh, I uh, greet everyone uh, who are here happily. I'm sharing uh, my thoughts on this uh, subject matter. 
uh, Omnibus Law from the Malaysian Experience. Thank you again for inviting me. Uh, uh, Miss Priska was asking me if I am Malaysian or Indonesian. Uh, that uh, I, 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 I am actually an Indonesian now currently uh, attached to this uh, Malaysian University. Yeah? So this Malaysian University is located in uh, near in Kuala Lumpur or in uh, near Kuala Lumpur, which is Selangor State. Um, and uh, I uh, shall give my, my disclaimer in the first place, yeah, because Prof. Patrick uh, beautifully uh, highlighted uh, his uh, viewpoints on this uh, topic, um, notifying us also in the beginning that he came from this constitutional Either it was Prof. Patrick or I think the Madam uh, Chairman was uh, notifying us that uh, Prof. Patrick was from the constitutional uh, law uh, uh, background. Yeah. Uh, my disclaimer to everyone here is that uh, I am not from. Uh, I am not specialized in either constitutional constitutional law or administrative law. Uh, in which yeah, we would have dealt so much about these issues. So, uh, but I am happy to share uh, when I was approached by the uh, committee uh, to share about this, at least I have, first I have learned about the law and legal system in Malaysia and the legislative processes in Malaysia. And also I have had um, benefit yeah, or advantage to witness the legislative uh, processes as well as some histories being made because I have been in Malaysia for more than 20 years. Uh, so that is my disclaimer. It is not my specialized uh, area, perhaps uh, unlike uh, some of the speakers over uh, here today, but I'm uh, here to uh, share what I experience, what I notice and observe from the general, general law perspective. Uh, I uh, like to uh, proceed, but before that, I like to uh, uh, so uh, thank yeah, Doctor uh, Doctor Ali, is it? Uh, Doctor Ali, who was giving the introduction uh, for for introducing uh, this program and for sharing with us also. So let me now now proceed with the presentation. Uh, as you see in the agenda today, uh, we have a few things. Let me just proceed. What is omnibus legislation? Of course, we do some research and we can find that this is very interesting, uh, though controversial uh, area of uh, legislative uh, processes. Uh, and of course, we are here today because we have been recently awakened here by this um, uh, latest initiative uh, in Indonesian parliament. Uh, I have been following also the news and the stories um, about this omnibus law, even though in, uh, in reality, omnibus legislation is not something new. Uh, it may not be new either in Indonesia, if I'm, I, mean, I stand corrected for that. But when we look at any countries, there will be somehow some experience yeah, being uh, taking place, uh, including Malaysia, that sometimes our parliament uh, uh, faced with this situation that there is a matter that will have to be um, dealt with. And it so happens that um, uh, the, the, the situation, the circumstances are so different. So among others, for example, if they really need to uh, do something quick and speedy um, in terms of uh, legislating process, and certainly, uh, you know, the traditional way of uh, legislation may not really help. Then sometimes uh, the situation faced by our parliament is also that they have uh, something which is so complicated, yeah, which is so complicated, uh, which may not be easily dealt with in normal process. That's why we have this situation where the lawmaking becomes um, 
um, extraordinary or in the word used by these writers such as uh, Gluck, O'Connell and Poe, as well as another writer by name of Barbara Sinclair, it is called unorthodox lawmaking. So it is a lawmaking process, which is a lawmaking process, which is not usual. And among others is this omnibus legislation, legislative process. So omnibus legislative process is only one situation or one example where the lawmaking process takes place extraordinarily, meaning it is not usual. Uh, how is it not usual? As we see in this uh, definition, which already has been shared by the by Prof. Patrick before me, uh, omnibus in omnibus legislation, we see that there is this package of bill yeah, or the uh, rancangan undang-undang, RUU, uh, which is not very usual because uh, you see that this RUU is so huge, so long, lengthy, yeah, lengthy document. I was informed about hundreds or even about, above thousand pages because it packages together lots of things, lots of issues and combined yeah, all these diverse subjects. So that becomes the omnibus legislation. Why the word omni, why omnibus? Because actually omnibus is from this uh, type of uh, public vehicle, omnibus. Yeah, uh, Why we call it omnibus? Because omnibus takes people uh, wherever, uh, which, uh, whoever wants to take the bus, then they are allowed to take the bus. So omnibus takes people from um, uh, all types of uh, uh, communities, all types of places, all types of background can take this omnibus. That's why the word omnibus means it actually takes a lot of things, takes off a uh, I mean, lot of matters. So when it comes to omnibus legislation, also added by Gluck and O'Connell and Poe in his in their write, writing in 2015, it is a legislation that brings together many different subjects. For example, investment in one hand and then uh, employment on the other, uh, environment, and then you also have some uh, education parts, a lot of things, yeah, a lot of things. And this is, as, it, as I said earlier, departing from the conventional process in multiple ways, meaning it is not usual. It is uh, not as what we have seen in normal circumstances. Um, it, sometimes it comprises of mini bills, yeah, mini bills, meaning some, some RUU, some bills that are put together. You know? So in some countries, omnibus legislation means it is a multiple multiple legislation. It can happen like that. But in our recent experience in Indonesia, it is one single bill, right? But in other countries, sometimes they put different bills into one package and discuss it together and approve it at once. Discuss it and debate it at once and approve it at once and become like one group of uh, legislation. These things also happen. So we were asking, I mean, the, also the chairman was, uh, the moderator, sorry, was telling us why, why, why is, what is good in that? What is good in that? Why still people do that? Because it is not new. So it has been there for some time the, in, in the United States, in Europe, in Asia, you know, uh, our countries, uh, our neighboring countries like Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, Australia, of course, and even Indonesia, we, we have been doing that. So we want to know what is it behind it. Okay, so I'd like to share uh, from this perspective. Uh, first, <clears throat> omnibus legislation has been chosen by parliament because it, it is necessary to infuse one big system thinking on subject matter. Because before this legislation, perhaps uh, the, the subject matter had been um, had existed on a very diverse and different uh, thinking system. Thinking system here means the way people think about it, the way people know about it. So you will see for, uh, as an example later on, yeah, uh, as an example. Uh, so when, when, when we are to face all this situation and we realize that there are so many ways people look into the subject matter, then we are looking at the possibility uh, uh, at, the, at the opportunity to unify this to unify the different thinking system. This has been highlighted uh, when the United States was about to uh, legislate on food system, on food law, yeah? on food law. So the food thinking system was so different and diverse on how the supply and chain uh, system uh, takes place and so on and so forth. Yeah? So that's why they were thinking of putting 
a huge, a lot of uh, measures and things in one legislation in their food law. And then also uh, people opt or parliament opt for omnibus approach for the, pur for the purpose of uh, alignment. Yeah, uh, you see a few uh, points. Uh, I'll go down in the left side, going down first. It is the best way to collaborate on the overarching common agenda. So if you think we have a common agenda and a lot of issues to be put together, so for the purpose of uh, pushing this common agenda, then uh, omnibus legislation is preferred. And also um, it is uh, done uh, uh, because uh, it is supported by uh, more uh, no, uh, infrastructure, meaning today, we will see more and more um, omnibus legislation than in the past. Why is that? Because we have more capabilities to actually see things yeah, in uh, different perspectives at once. So that will it trigger, of course, a lot of uh, uh, perspectives, suggestions. That's why things will become more diverse, will uh, tend to be more diverse and and. Uh, uh, multiple interpretations and that is why it is more likely that parliaments will have a big law where they will put a lot of things. Then we go to the right side here, alignment into a highly complex and politicized subject matter. We know that parliament is a political institution and it, they carry different aspirations, different ideas. No, to so uh, for the purpose of uh, you know, uh, having a good law, then they are trying to accommodate. They are trying to accommodate. So this is so much related to the, how, you know, the political um, uh, circumstances. Um, and one more thing, it's very uh, interesting to know that um, in, while, while you are having a omnibus legislation, it is easier to reach a compromise. Yeah, it, it is easier to reach an agreement. Because if you only, if you uh, detail out a lot of things, then you will have a lot of views as well as debates and, and, and disagreements. But the moment you put things together, sometimes the, 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 the details will be covered, yeah? will, be, will not be uh, obvious. Yeah? Well, you can see it as positive or negative. Uh, it depends on the perspectives, right? But uh, uh, we have this uh, saying in, in English, uh, it says that, uh, the evil is in the details. So the more you see into the details, then you will see a lot of problems. So sometimes the the, 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 the the approach of omnibus legislation is try to cover all those you know, uh, details uh, for the purpose of getting compromise on the bigger agenda. So that's why omnibus uh, legislation is still uh, being preferred. And uh, it may also provide add-ons or goodies. As I said earlier, you, in an omnibus legislation, people will have a, uh, the general agenda or general uh, subject matters, but then the small, small matters, they can always add on for the purpose of uh, complying with uh, or accommodating uh, other parties or other people, uh, I mean, other uh, groups or parties in the parliament. So uh, to cut short, what I have been saying is that omnibus legislation is so much about getting compromise, yeah? compromise or approve, uh, approval and, and agreement uh, for otherwise uh, what can be a very uh, controversial and complicated matter. Uh, however, I also highlight the problems with the omnibus legislation among others, because this is an unorthodox uh, lawmaking. I mean, people are not really ready for it. People are not used to it. And of course, in parliament, we have uh, different uh, views, different uh, way of thinking. And not only that, we, uh, I mean, uh, academia as a, uh, I, I must say, academia like us are also stakeholders for this legislative process. So sometimes we are just not happy if things are being done differently. And it is seeking for compromise. You know, there is uh, sometimes agenda hidden in the goodies. Goodies means the small matters. Yeah, as, as I said, sometimes in the small, small provisions, you don't see it, but there could be some hidden agendas in there. So that has been also highlighted. And it may invite future problems uh, when it comes to implementation, also the institutional enforcement, because the moment you involve lots of uh, subject matters, then certainly it will involve uh, lots of or multiple institutions in enforcing it. We don't know, like this uh, 
omnibus law may seem to have passed the test, you know, in the parliament, it is already, you know, approved. But what about the enforcement? The moment it tries to enforce, then you will realize, and sometimes if the government is not uh, strong enough, then you will see, you know, clashes as well as disagreement within the government who is supposed to uh, execute and enforce the law. So this uh, is something which may happen in future. So I highlighted for you here, which of course I'll share with you all these slides, uh, some of these uh, quotes from these writers, yeah, that uh, omnibus legislation depart from conventional process uh, in multiple ways. Then Barbara said it may limit the ability of individual members of Congress to understand and influence the content of legislation. I must say not only uh, not only laymen and people do not understand the law, but maybe even our members of a uh, representative in the parliament may not even understand it clearly, you know, what is being uh, approved in, in the law. Uh, I'm not uh, accusing anyone, but these things is very much likely, yeah. Also, statutory interpretation can be very hard. And you know that the moment the law is passed and to be enforced by executive, and if there is any um, um, uh, disagreement on the interpretation, it has to go to the court. So all this, you know, interpretative uh, function of the court will become very hard, you know, and our courts will have to look at the law and the law is like 1000 pages. So there will be another task for our judiciary to uh, have a very proper yeah, uh, interpretation on the law. So this is also highlighted or uh, viewed as a possible problems yeah, uh, or, or potential problems. Left. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, then we have few more. Let me just, uh, I think I have mentioned in, in, in general, so I'm not going to uh, read uh, each of this. Yeah. Uh, but let me just uh, Take the first one. It does little to promote a deeply coordinated and systematic approach. It is it is difficult. You have a very big law. It is difficult to actually do the inter, for example, interdepartmental coordination or inter, you know, parliamentary uh, 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 debates. We don't know. I'm I'm not uh, specifically referring to the Indonesian omnibus recently, but whenever this happens. Uh, it is not an easy job uh, for the, the for the parliament to actually look into this law and make a coordination uh, work. Uh, it is very very hard. All right, now let me go very uh, specifically to my task, which is uh, in Malaysia. Malaysia practices bicameral chamber legis uh, for legislative purpose, which is uh, Senate and House of Representative. The Senate, uh, in Bahasa, we call it Dewan Negara, and in uh, the House of Representative is Dewan Rakyat. Uh, it is not like DPR or MPR in the past, or and it is not like DPR and DP, uh, DPD, for example, but these two camera, uh, two chambers of parliament actually are involved in any law, meaning in one, if you want to pass the law, it has to go through these two uh, chambers. If it started in Dewan Rakyat and, and approved in Dewan Rakyat, then it has to go to the Dewan Negara. Or sometimes it may start in Dewan Negara, then after it is approved, it has to go to Dewan Rakyat. And finally, it has to be approved by the king in Malaysia, which is the Yang Di Pertuan Agong. So not the prime minister, but the king. Yeah. Uh, so who are they? Of course, the uh, House of Representatives, they are all 222 elected members yeah, by election. But the Senate... The Senate uh, comprised of uh, some part or some portion uh, representative from each state. We have 13 plus uh, 13 state plus one uh, federal territory. So it is all 14 states uh, plus uh, appointees yeah, by the king. So the king appointed and normally these are appointed from, you know, uh, community, uh, you know, people from different communities. Yeah. Okay, I want to show you the process which is uh, highlighted in this table. And the face, the, the very young face you see here in the beginning, in the middle of the slide, he is uh, our current member of parliament. He is the youngest member of parliament appointed to the parliament at the age of 26, Said Sadiq. And he was our, he's our graduate and he was our law student in the past. So uh, we are happy. I mean, we are proud to have him. And he was uh, holding this uh, post of ministry, minister of uh, youth uh, and sports. Uh, but now you see the political situation in Malaysia has been uh, changing quite often. He is no longer a minister now, but still a, a member of parliament. So as you will see, 
uh, in every uh, uh, legislative process, it will go through uh, phases. For example, first is first reading, and then second reading, then uh, committee stage, and then third reading. So the main discussion and debate is in the second reading, actually. Yeah? First reading is only announcement. Second reading is the whole debates uh, from all the members. And then uh, after it was approved, then it will go to the committee stage where more details will be highlighted and will be fine-tuned. And finally, it will be voted again or it will be presented again in the third reading. But normally, when it comes to the third reading, normally there is no uh, issue. No issue. The issue has been uh, in the second reading. So that is in one Dewan Rakyat. The moment this is done, it will go to the Dewan Negara and will go through the same process again. But as you will realize, the most of the discussion and heated debate will happen in the House of Representatives, Dewan Rakyat, because this is all the elected members of the uh, political parties and the elections, including the individual uh, elect, uh, elected members. So. I just want to highlight to you these two uh, camera, two chambers uh, track uh, in Malaysia. Now I want to highlight to you the experience in Malaysia. We used to have uh, some uh, omnibus legislation in the past, even though uh, officially uh, the government or the parliament never used the word omnibus legislation. Yeah, uh, but it is a uh, just like the, of the nature of the omnibus legislation. But in 1998, it deals with the Communications and Multimedia Act because it consolidates and repeals some laws, including Broadcast Act, Press Act, and Telecommunication Act. So how many laws? Only three laws. But we consider it as a, this is not 70 or 60 or 70 uh, legislation, but only three laws being consolidated. So this is a, a must because we are talking about new technology, right? Then in 2010, actually, uh, the one you see here in 2010 and 2013, they are all about financial uh, act, yeah, financial law. So there are a few laws being repealed yeah, in each of these, but not more than five laws, actually. Uh, few laws, few acts, as well as some guidelines and then rules, rulings, uh, then they are all being accommodated into a new Financial Services Act. So one is, especially for this, uh, Lab One is, is actually uh, uh, one authority, uh, uh, we call it a, a special, special area. And then uh, the other for Islamic Financial Services Act and another one is for Financial Services Act. It actually uh, repeals some laws such as uh, Payment System Act, you know, uh, Insurance Act, you know, everything under the financial services. And so uh, still the main issue is about financial services. And then very interestingly, uh, the very recent in 2020, we have this COVID-19 Act, actually just to shorten it call it COVID-19 Act 2020, as you realize, it makes temporary modification on 16 other acts. This is uh, by large uh, one of the biggest, yeah, uh, or, or my, I would say the biggest uh, uh, omnibus law in Malaysia. However, uh, I must say we didn't have big demonstration. We didn't have much debate on this because we actually feel the need of it. This is actually, even though it says that it changes 16 acts, but actually it uh, brings uh, temporary changes only. As long as this COVID-19 pandemic is still uh, going on. So we change some law, for example, uh, some contractual law uh, that makes certain contract. Yeah? Uh, for example, you already go, you wanted to go for Umrah, for example, or travel, but because of pandemic, then the travel uh, had to be canceled. So can you sue the travel uh, agent or the event organizer? Uh, be, be, based on this law, you cannot. The word, uh, I mean, you, I mean, the right of the uh, person uh, upon contractual breach will be uh, negated yeah? because nobody can, you know, stop this. Yeah? This is something very extraordinary. Yeah. So, okay, these are all the experience, but I must say we didn't experience lots of uh, debates, public debates, because you must also understand in Malaysia, it's quite different things are done very differently from Indonesia. Most of the public uh, participations actually done uh, through the proper methods of, for example, uh, conferences by way of uh, correspondence, by way of uh, meetings, uh, not by way of uh, street demonstration. It actually doesn't happen so much eh, like that in, in Malaysia. Right. So this is just example that the 
omnibus legislation has been uh, giving uh, you know a huge uh, uh, impact. So what are the lessons that we learn? The lessons we learn from Malaysian experience, number one, uh, omnibus law was uh, necessary for the purpose of infusion into a single system thinking. I give example in telecommunication, you know, because we used to have broadcast, we used to have uh, media, different types of media, then we realized that these things cannot, cannot be separately legislated. So we need uh, to have a new convergent way of thinking. And that's why we have this uh, modern uh, communications and multimedia act. And then also uh, for, to, for the purpose of increasing efficiency, such as in the Financial Act. Also for the purpose of accommodating new needs and rulings, because a lot of uh, new things, including the Islamic economics, Islamic financial uh, ruling, then we have to accommodate all of them and, and becomes a new law. And for the purpose of budget bill, yeah, budget bill uh, traditionally or historically has been about various aspect i think in many, in any country's budget bill is always a nature of uh, omnibus legislation because you discuss a lot of things under the budget bill then for speedy solutions such as in the covid-19 act and last but not least to avoid injustices because we need this covid-19 act and there are a lot of things happening in many and multiple multiple industries and subject matters then we need to act fast and therefore we have this uh, uh, omnibus legislation all right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is my concluding uh, part, concluding slide, as you see. Sometimes, yes, omnibus legislation is, it is indeed an unor unorthodox, meaning it's unusual way of lawmaking. But it will remain to be there, meaning we will see again and again in future, yeah, due to the, the need of it, yeah, like sometimes efficiency, subject matter complexity, and technological convergence. And then the lawmakers increasing capacity is also make it possible that we will have more and more legislation of omnibus nature. Uh, and then still we know that whenever there is an omnibus legislation, it may invite for some controversy. Because as uh, we say, I mean, it may cover some details, you know, or it may go just to accommodate a lot of needs. So there will be controversy. Uh, we, can't, we can't really avoid that. However, I argue that Yes, we still can control yeah, some effect of these controversies. For example, like in the US, for example, many states in the US, they have law which says that any legislation must have only one subject matter in one law. So we can uh, do more research in the US. Many states have this kind of uh, act saying that you cannot have the law which has a lot of subject matters. Uh, that is being uh, done in the US itself, especially in the state level, not federal level. Yeah. And last but not least, we can uh, also empower the court, yeah, because at the end, it is still the court who has the power yeah, to test the material as well as the constitutionality of the law. If we are not happy, then we can take this further to the court in order to test its constitutionality. So, so with this, uh, I must say, yes, we have this all pros and cons. And uh, it is really for us to always test uh, this need of omnibus legislation in the near future. Thank you very much. Uh, just a list of reference for you and thank you for the attention. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sonny. Uh, so um, you have so many, um, you, you have so many thoughts on the Malaysian experience. Uh, Although it is not necessarily called as the omnibus law, but it has the omnibus nature. So we still have three more minutes to Professor Patrick. Are you going to give kind of a concluding remarks before you leave us on two o'clock? Before I move to our beloved dean, Dr. Muhammad Ali Safar. Um, look, um, I've been I've been answering the questions in the chat, and I've been using. Um, Google Translate. So I'm hoping that the translations have been good. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, what I, what I will do is, uh, there's only one more question I've got to um, answer and that's from Alda Rifad uh, Risky. Um, so I'll answer that question. And then what I might do is um, put my email address in the chat. And if people want to send me questions, then after, this, after I leave, um, I can answer them in the next few days. Um, but I also just wanted to take the opportunity to congratulate uh, Dr. Uh, Zulhuda 
uh, Sonny on his outstanding presentation. I'm, I'm uh, was uh, my knowledge of uh, Malaysia and it's um, uh, was greatly enriched. And your slides are excellent. Um, so congratulations, and um, I look forward to uh, uh, communicating with you via email after the uh, after this uh, session is over. So. I will leave my uh, email address in the chat. If anybody has any questions, uh, they can send me an email. And thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this session. Um, and um, uh, I, I hope that um, uh, may, may you all be blessed by God uh, and uh, have a wonderful weekend and, and good luck with all of the uh, important work that you're all doing. Thank you, Prof. Petri. Okay, I'll see you later. Okay, you thank you very much, Professor Patrick. My it's pleasure. very nice to have you here. And maybe it's, in the near future, pleasure. we will have you again, still I discussing would, I, another I would, topics. I, I would love to come back to Malang. As soon as COVID travel restrictions are lifted, I will be on the first plane, plane to Indonesia. All right, thank you very okay. much. We are fortunate right. to have you. Thank so you. now uh, I will give time to Dr. Muhammad Ali Safaat our expert on constitutional law in Brawijaya University. Uh, Pak Ali would like to share us some pros and cons of the enactment of the omnibus law type of legislation in Indonesia, because it is the first and sadly it is not conducted in a proper way. So maybe Pak Ali would like to explore more about that. So the time is yours, Pak Ali. Wait, I mean, it's another meeting. <laughs> it's fine, sir. I know you <laughs> have a lot of work to do, and we are we are happy to have you today. Okay, thank you, Prisca, and thank you, Prof. Patrick Kaiser, and uh, some of the definition and then experiences uh, from the other country has been told by the uh, speakers, uh, previous speakers, and I'm going to present it the pros and cons concerning the uh, omnibus law, not only in Indonesia, but uh, uh, in other countries, uh, specifically in uh, Canada and then in uh, some states of in United States of America. First of all, I think uh, Dr. Sonny Zulhuda and then Professor Patrick has explained about the definition of omnibus law, but for Indonesians, the important thing is how we define on difference uh, between omnibus law and codification. Because I think in some countries, the codification is also set as omnibus law. Uh, an omnibus law, the key keyword is uh, a bill consisting a number related, so related but separate part that seek uh, or repeal one or several existing acts. So one bill, one undang-undang, uh, change or amend or repeal part of the other acts. So this is different with codification because codification is systematic regulation. So this is a, uni, a unity, a union in one act. So uh, this regulation in a single code concerning many aspects, a broader field of law, but uh, have close relation. For example, uh, right now in Indonesia, I think the House of Representatives still have agenda to uh, deliberate the Bill of Criminal Code. And if they agree about the Criminal Code, so many acts actually will repeal by this code. For example, the Anti-Corruption Code, the uh, 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 money laundering, the domestic violence, it also will be codified in one code that it's criminal code. So this is the difference with the uh, omnibus law. And 
omnibus law actually uh, in other countries has been uh, has re experience about the omnibus law for example in canada it's in 1868 uh, has the omnibus law the act that continue for a limited time the several act therein mentioned but i think it's not like a job creation act if we said this uh, act as omnibus law in canada in 1868 actually we also have this kind of act in the first uh, proclamation we have acts that continue to uh, enforce the the dutch colonial law uh, so this is a kind of omnibus law but not like a uh, job creation act the second the criminal law amendment acts in canada also but this is i think the substance it's have close relation between one part to the other part because this act uh, amend or repeal a certain act concerning the uh, uh, the crime uh, from the the child crime to the corruption and the other so this is concerning a criminal act and also the um, uh, miscellaneous statute law amendment act that's amend many many acts in canada so this is uh, i think in many countries also have this kind of act and the pros of the omnibus law in many country especially in canada and uh, united states of america first uh, this kind of act will unifying principle in single purpose unifying trade and unit unitary in unitary purpose uh, so uh, a certain government in a certain time have one agenda have one principle that will bring uh, to the law by men or by repeal many many of the acts existing acts that's not consistent with the principle bring by the government so this is uh, the the principle of the omnibus law but actually this is will uh, rise a problem because every single act that uh deliberate and promulgated might be promulgated uh in spirit of time of course have their own principle of course have their own purposes for example we have in indonesia we have the agrarian law that created or uh, promulgated in 1960 so they have are they have their own uh, principle that of course differ from the for example the act of uh, foreign investment that promulgated in reform era so how this act is still consistent in their uh, norm itself between one part between one paragraph to the other paragraph if repealed by the omnibus law the second pros is Uh, the omnibus law will facilitate the simultaneous consideration of all the interrelated of a particular agenda so because they have one principle uh, and they have many act that correlated each other so this is uh, will deliberate in one consideration third grouping different proposal on the same subject so this is will help to uh, mix uh, the debate on the parliament focus in a certain subject the fourth cleaning job i think this is the the main argument of omnibus law in indonesia because the government uh, had said before that one of the problem of investment in indonesia is because Uh, hyper regulation so many regulation so doing business is not easy uh, we can compare with the vietnam usually they compare with the vietnam so all of the regulation should be clean how to clean this regulation by one stroke so by the omnibus law the fifth safe time and shorten legislation proceeding so we have the fact that uh, omnibus law job creation act uh, only uh, less than one uh, years 
in deliberation in the House of Representatives with President and then promulgated the President. And the last, this is, I think it's politically, uh, the omnibus law will generate embarrassment within opposition parties by diluting controversial move within a complex package. I think the next slide will show how this works. That based on the assumption that nobody will, would be satisfied by each, by each phase of the deal if considered in insulation. So it means that if the parliament uh, deliberate or negotiate, negotiated between the government with the opposition, they will never satisfy because it is only in one uh, uh, act only in one issue but that we should try to include in another package a little something for everybody if in one act uh, the government have uh, uh, have something to offer to the opposition so the opposition also get something from the act that would be uh, approved by the parliament so uh, they will agree the opposition will agree so this is to minimize the consensus between uh, the government with the with the opposition in the parliament so this is politically used uh, by the government uh, that introduced the omnibus bill to the parliament and the contrast the contrast of the omnibus law the first uh, by omnibus law, individual member of the parliament are prevented from saying yes or no in every single issue. So we know that the process of the deliberation of the Job Creation Act in Indonesia, uh, maybe only 10%, the member of the House of Representatives reads whole document of the omnibus bill. I think maybe less than 10 percent. So they, they can say yes or no because they, they do not they didn't understand what's the substance of the omnibus law. And second, uh, this omnibus bill cannot be referred to the appropriate specialist committee for scrutinize. Uh, in Indonesia, I think we have uh, 12 committee in the House of Representatives from Committee 1 until Committee 12. Committee 1 from for uh, international relation, uh, foreign political affair. Committee 2 for uh, government, for local government. Committee 3 for law. So when the omnibus law consisting 79, 78 acts, that's uh, uh, have the substance concerning many, many aspects from the environmental law uh, to the government, local government, to the halal product, which committee should deliberate, should read deeply the concept of omnibus bill uh, delivered by the government. The third, parliament could lose their up opportunity to identify and correct any flaw the bill might contain. So this is already happened in Indonesia uh, from the differences of pages until uh, the, the, the clerical error. I don't know, is it true clerical error or maybe substantial error? And because of this is a big work and then our parliament is lack of capacity so all government do it the government draft the bill the government will mix uh, revision after uh, the agreement in the house of representative and the government will make the uh, government regulation to implement the act and of course the last limited public participation and because this limited public participation, I think why the people in Indonesia, uh, especially this university student and labor, uh, disagree with uh, the substance of the uh, this job creation act. And in United United States, 
uh, in the California state uh, have the principle that a statute shall embrace but one subject, which shall be expressed by its, its title. So uh, not like the Omnibus Law, uh, Job Creation Act, but the substance is so many. Uh, if a statute embraces a subject not expresses in its title, only the part not expressed is void. So this is the principle in the California. Why this is uh, happen in United States? Because uh, in one case, uh, Commonwealth versus Barnett in Pennsylvania, uh, the judge said that bill that's popularly called omnibus bill become a crying evil, not only from the confusion and destruction of the legislative mind by the jumbling together of incongruous subject, but still more by the facility the offer to corrupt combination of minorities with different interests to force the passage of bill with provision which could never succeed if they stood on their spirit merit. So uh, in many forum, I said it's the legal policy. Actually, the legal policy of Omnibus Law Indonesia is for easy in doing business by uh, make uh, simple to invest in Indonesia, uh, simple to make corporation in Indonesia and also uh, foreign investment. So if this uh, kind of act, uh, if this kind of bill deliver independently to the House of Representatives, I think the opposition or the public of Indonesia will reject this kind of uh, acts. So why the government uh, give the good name job creation acts. Uh, in the United States also an organization, social organization uh, called John Sais DC that campaigned to stop omnibus law uh, uh, to the congressional leader uh, because uh, uh, they said that uh, it's built only for one subject and to stand or fall entirely it's on its own merit. So uh, they will reject or accept the bill, not because the other uh, substance in one uh, X that's uh, delivered to the Congress. And how about the Omni Indonesian Omnibus Law? Actually, we have experiences about the kind of Omnibus Law. Uh, we have regulation, uh, MPR regulation, uh, resolution number one, 2003, that repealed or declared void many resolution of the MPR and also stated which uh, resolution of the MPR that still have uh, uh, law effects in Indonesia. We also have the Act number no. 5, uh, 1969, uh, concerning the status of various presidential decrees and Presidential Regulations Act. Uh, this act is uh, after the end of the old era. And when the old era, the President Sukarno uh, from uh, 1956, uh, 59 until 1999, never uh, made a Parliament Act. So the law, it's by the Presidential Decree or presidential regulation, or by the emergency law that created by the president itself. So in this transition period, uh, the government uh, review all of the presidential decree and presidential regulation and said which one is still uh, good for the next government. And then this uh, become an act. Uh, similar to the Parliament Act and which one is not uh, the law anymore. We also have uh, uh, Parliament Act number 23, 2014 concerning local government that repeals certain part of three acts. 
uh, concerning legislative, I think the Parliament Act, uh, because on local government also uh, have uh, regulation concerning the local uh, Parliament, uh, the DPRD in Indonesia, and also concerning the general election. Uh, so, but it's not so many acts that repealed by this uh, local government act and the drafting the 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 act it's one uh, unified act not like the job creation that's only chain only amend a certain paragraph certain article of many many acts so this is our experience in indonesia how about job creation law this is the process the first time the idea was delivered by the president on his commemoration as president in 20 October of 9, uh, 2019 and then delivered to, to the House of Representatives in February this year and approved by uh, the House of Representatives in October this year and promulgated in the 2nd November of uh, this year. So this is very fast uh, fast track uh, we, we call it because uh, this is less than one years uh, to deliver in in house of representative we can uh, compare with for example the bill of criminal code that's already uh, deliberated in house of representative uh, since maybe 1985 until now it's uh, not yet uh, 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 decide uh, by the House of Representatives and the government. And uh, of course, this huge substance and then fast uh, track in deliberation uh, raise a problem. The first, the problem is concerning the form because based on our legislation law, uh, we only know the five kind of, of five form of act. The first is X in general, one subject, one issue. Uh, for example, the X on uh, local government, the X on uh, 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 general election. Uh, that's the substance. It's from the principle until the detail uh, of uh, uh, the regulation concerning the local government, for example, uh, what is the local government until the structure of the local government, how to create the local regulation and the other. The substance not uh, amend the other acts. If the substance uh, is changed the other acts, it's only uh, states in the end of the act. That's uh, regulation concerning, for example, the local uh, legislative in uh, in uh, legislative acts uh, fights by or repeal by this uh, local government acts. And the second is act on stipulation of government regulation in lieu. So uh, this uh, makes the government regulation that uh, uh, that's change a certain acts by regulation in emergency condition become an acts or become a parliament act act on international agreement of ratification act of on amendment of certain act so in indonesia uh, we said for example uh, act number five uh, 2020 concerning the amendment of act number blah 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 yes blah 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 concerning so this is the kind of amendment of certain act and act on revocation of certain act so this is specifically to refocus uh, certain act. This is the first problem. The second problem is public participation. Uh, the third problem of valid document, because until after the promulgation, we have the problem of uh, some clerical error and the other. See, this is from the formal aspect. And the second is substance. I think many debate, many discussion in Indonesia concerning the substance about the legal policy, whether it's really to create job by 
open uh, entrepreneurship for the micro and 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 middle entrepreneur or actually it give the red carpet for the uh, foreign investor the problem with labor protection the problem with the local government because many of uh, 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 many of the of the business of the local government centralized to the central government environmental law corruption corruption and then uh, small scale and middle scale uh, entrepreneurship protection so this is a, the the problem and of course by the promulgation of the uh, omnibus law in indonesia it's not the end of the story because uh this is uh enter to the other step the judicial review in the constitutional court until now uh there are nine application that challenge the omnibus law in the constitutional court both in formal concerning the procedure and the step of the uh, uh uh law creating of the omnibus law and the second uh, concerning the substantial the substance of the omnibus law in the three cases three application it's both formal and substantial judicial review and also we now have the problem with the implication or with the operationalization of the omnibus law because this law even uh, one of the goal is to uh, simplify regulation even one of the goal is to stroke hundred of the act uh, that's like hyper regulation but actually this job creation uh, act need at least 44 government regulation to implement and i believe i strongly believe that each of the government regulation will also needs other lower regulation ministerial regulation and i'm not sure i'm not convinced that between one government regulation to other government regulation it's synchronized each other even uh, this is, they have correlation for example uh, uh, the government regulation concerning land management and property with government regulation in settlement of neglected land and area with the government regulation on land procurement for public interest development this have correlation is other but i think it's very hard to synchronize each other and the president give three months for their cabinet to meet all of 44 government regulation uh, of course uh, we hope that it's not going to be hyper regulation again so i hope uh, uh, they have um, much more time to create this government regulation so it's uh, not uh, useless because if uh, this uh, government regulation becomes hyper regulation again so there is uh, useless uh, we uh, have omnibus law and useless uh, of the uh, demonstration of the student and labor because uh, the condition is just the same before the omnibus law. Thank you, Priska. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Muhammad Ali Safaat. So now we are coming to the last presentation from Dr. Sukami SHMH. She is going to share her thought on the economic law perspective of the omnibus law. 
So we are fortunate to have Dr. Sukarmi because she is an expertise. She is an expert on the economic law uh, because uh, prior to becoming the head of law study program, she served as the commissioner of the Business Competition Supervisory Commissions of Indonesia for two periods from 2006 to 2012. So Dr. Sukami, please share us your thought on this perspective. Okay, thank you Ibu Priska. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Welcome uh, Professor Patrick and Dr. So Sony from Malaysia. Okay, um, I am the last speaker. I think I I just make a conclusion. I think it's very simple for us. Okay, yes. Um, uh, my chair about the omnibus law in economic law perspective. Yes, this is uh, the background. What well, I think. Uh, so many uh, reason what uh, why the omnibus law come to Indonesia. Pak Ali have been uh, present and then uh, Malaysian uh, perspective and then from Mr. Patrick. Yes, uh, I think that making new law to amend several laws at one in Indonesia uh, we call it the undang-undang jagat. Omnibus law is undang-undang sapu jagat. Uh, so many uh, law uh, become to the one law becoming the undang-undang sapu jagat. Um, the streamline regulation in term of number so many num uh, so many uh, uh, apa, law become to the one uh, package. This concept is we know that uh, not common in civil law system but common in uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon, for example, United States likes uh, uh, Mr. Patrick and Pa Ali said uh, before. Then the use of the omnibus law concept is this is able to eliminate the many overlap of law, which is uh, vertical and horizontal, to make uh, the synchronized both horizontal and vertically of the law. And omnibus law is a short way to avoid placing rules both vertical and horizontally. And I think uh, we can uh, like this uh, definition, so many definition and uh, many terminology of uh, omnibus law. Yes. Okay, this is uh, Mr. Patrick also mentioned before about the they can be good or they can uh, not good about the omnibus law. This is the problematic as mentioned also by the uh, Professor Patrick. Now, uh, the case last year passed the job to creation bill, uh, law uh, number 21, 2020 about the creation uh, job law. Uh, there are uh, consist of 11 clusters, namely simplification of licensing, investment requirement, employment, issue of doing business, empowerment of protection as an uh, cooperative, and then the research and innovation support cluster, government administration, imposition of sanction, and acquisition issue of investment and national strategic and special economic zone. This is uh, the uh, content of substance of the uh, what is the omnibus law on creation job law in Indonesia. Now, if we look at the omnibus law and economic constitution, we have the cons, uh, constitu constitutional Undang-Undang Dasar 1945, Article 33 is an economic constitution. We have a question. Is it the uh, omnibus law or a uh, creation job law? This is a suite with Article 33 or not? Yeah. The job creation law is based on equal rights, legal standing, easy of doing business, togetherness, and independence. Equitable rights are carried out by fulfilling the rights of citizens to descend work and life livelihoods and are carried out evenly throughout Indonesia. If we look at Article 33, this is a very, very uh, message how to make the social welfare. 
if we look at the omnibus law in economic law perspective, there are two perspectives of economic law. This is uh, the theory from uh, Professor Sunarti Hartono. The first theory about the economic development law concerning the regulation and legal thought about uh, methods of improving and developing Indonesian economic life. How to increasing protection national and planning. If we look at the con con uh, content of the omnibus law or uh, creation job law, this is uh, consists of the economic development law. Yeah, how to increase the investment, how to uh, make easy doing, etc., etc. And the second theory about the social economic law concerning the regulation and legal thought about how to sharing the result of national development is fair and even in according with the Indonesian human rights. I think this is uh, part of the cluster is consists of the social economic law. So the conclusion about the theory, the omnibus law in Indonesia consists of the economic development law and uh, social economic law. Uh, what about the theoretical test tool in the economic law to omnibus law? I, I, I will share uh, to you about the, there is uh, two theories about the law and development doctrine, which is used to build and relationship law and economic in uh, macro contents. And the second theoretical about the economic analysis of law, which is used as a micro analysis knife of article it's relevant law so that they are in line with the creation. This is the law is efficient or not in investment uh, to investment climb. Let, let us, uh, this, this is the first theory. The doctrine of law and development rests on Max Weber. We know that the classic thesis in his book, Economic and Society, state that Modern capitalism concentrated its effort on the calculability of the legal and administrative system whose function can be predicted rationally based on its generally fixed norm working like machines. In his view, we know that the development of capitalism requires formal rational legal instrument and institutions so that they can provide calculability and predictability. I think that uh, the theory used by the uh, contra people to the omnibus law in Indonesia because they uh, opin uh, their, their opinion that uh, the omnibus law is uh, capitalism, new capitalism in Indonesia. Uh, it be based on the Talcott Barson, the theory believes that the backwardness of developing countries is due to legal and institutional features that are still traditional. Yeah, this is uh, the Talcott person to look at the, what is uh, the Indonesia uh, law uh, concerning the omnibus law. This requires a transplant and duplication of modern features, including the legal substance in institution. Now, uh, the, uh, I would uh, to combine how the relationship between law and economic. Ekman, Ek, Ekman said that law and economic has the power to construct new discourse in law. Yeah, this is uh, the relationship uh, how the law and economic to uh, together to make a new paradigm, the legal science contributing to human life is a legal product that can provide insurance of protection of the dynamics of human life as an individual and uh, community. Community, and the second uh, about the law and economics uh, relationship contribution of economic and legal science understand in the interest of human life. And then economic, uh, based on the Pak Sajib uh, he said that economic decisions will only be a better academic result if not be formed by one other legal form. Okay. Now, in this theoretical horizontal, the law horizon, the law and job creation is very problematic. I think Pak Ali uh, had mentioned before about uh, the problematic of the creation uh, job law in Indonesia. From empirical perspective, 
post authorization Indonesia has entered into period of inclusive neoliberalism. Yeah, we know that there are so many commission commission in Indonesia. It is the mark by the development of legal institution ranging from the business competition supervisor commission, for example, and then uh, anti rasua or KPK corruption uh, commission, which function to create a level playing field and uh, create the high cost economy caused by uh, corruption. I think this is a new. Uh, commission how to make the Indonesia as uh, free for the uh, unfair competition and free for the corruption. Instead of constituting to improve and strengthen the institution that we already form through the job of creation law, the states lost confidence in inclusive neoliberalism and uh, took a research step. And next, uh, how to look at the, what, uh, the economic analysis of law. This regulatory perspective uses a uh, cost and benefit analysis, uh, social and environmental problem as a result of investment I directed uh, to use of a risk-based uh, approach. How to make the, uh, to, uh, to manage the risk, uh, risk of the, investment. In this context, that's compiler of academic perspective, uh, Undang-Undang Cipta Kerja, Creation Job Law, based on their way of thinking on the assumption of uh, Rona cost in the problem of social cost. Yeah, many demonstration and many uh, loss of job and something like that, where guarantees of protection, protection for investor ownership and low social and environmental transaction costs will make the parties adopt the most efficient solution in dealing with risk. How to make a, 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 a <clears throat> solution in dealing with risk. The illustration is if a pollution, for example, Across then this problem will be resolved between the polluting company and the pollution victim through the cheapest solution. How to make solution to make uh, the minimalism of uh, risk about the uh, regulation. This is uh, from Richard Posner, uh, economic concept analysis of law with if we look at the, uh, for example, omnibus law, it's mean uh, creation job law. Is it have a utility maximism to people or only on the parts of the people, for example, for the uh, capital owner or something like that? And then is it rational, national or not about the law? And then the stability of preferences and opportunity cost. And this is, uh, I think if we uh, look at the Back to the Article 33, this is a many question, a big question for me, especially, is it can to prove that a Cipta Kerja Law can keep the social welfare or not? And then in my conclusion, the economy has been on economic democracy property property for all this is uh, the message of the article 33 our constitution that is why the branches of production that are important to the country and to, to control the lives of the people must be controlled by the states yeah not by the other person but by state because this is uh, the function of the resources is this for property property for all Otherwise, the harm of production falls into the hands of those in power and the people whom he oppresses a lot. So, only a company that don't control livelihood of the masses can be in the hands of individuals. And then the earth and the water and the wealth of nature contained in the earth are the trees of the prosperity of the people. Last but not least, uh, Article 33 as a challenging from the Cipta Kerja Law. I think this is my presentation, very short. Thank you very much, Ibu Prisca, and uh, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much Ibu Sukarmi. So there is a question for you Ibu Sukarmi from yeah. Sandi Perma Nanugraha. Uh, dalam pasal 109 Undang-Undang nomor 11 tahun 2020 tentang cipta kerja menyatakan bahwa minimal untuk pendirian sebuah PT adalah satu orang. Apakah hal tersebut tidak melanggar ketentuan yang ada dalam pasal 7 ayat 1 Undang-Undang nomor 40 tahun 2007 tentang PT mengingat dalam pasal tersebut menyatakan bahwa minimal pendirian sebuah PT adalah dua orang? Ya. Yeah. Baik, terima kasih Bu Priska. Pertanyaannya bagus sekali, justru itu yang menjadi problem bagi kalangan uh, akademisi di dalam hukum bisnis, bahwa dengan artikel tersebut justru bertentangan memang dengan apa yang disebutkan tadi dalam Undang-Undang PT. Prinsip pendirian sebuah badan usaha itu harus di badan hukum khususnya, karena PT itu adalah badan hukum, maka harus didasarkan kepada kontrak atau perjanjian. Ya, minimal perjanjian itu harus dengan dua orang ya satu pihak dengan pihak lain saling mengikatkan diri untuk membuat atau berbuat sesuatu atau tidak berbuat sesuatu nah justru ini dengan omnibus law justru ini adalah sesuatu yang menurut kami di kalangan bisnis law adalah tidak tepat di, dimanapun namanya PT itu mesti harus ada sebuah perjanjian minimal adalah dua orang atau dua uh, Ya, kalau toh dengan orang dengan orang ataupun badan hukum dengan non orang yaitu badan usaha maka harus dua orang itu ya. Nah, barangkali ini juga yang nantinya ya saya kira ini menjadi satu apa ya persoalan nanti yang akan disampaikan juga tentunya di dalam uji material di Mahkamah Konstitusi tentunya karena terus terang bertentangan dengan hakikat pendirian sebuah badan hukum itu. Baik, terima kasih Ibu Sukarmi. Mungkin ada pertanyaan dari yang lainnya bisa ditujukan ke Dr. Sony, ke Dr. Ali Safat, atau ke Dr. Sukarmi. So, if everyone have a questions for our speakers, you may raise your hand or unmute your speaker, your microphone directly. Is there any question from the floor? Uh, saya mungkin ingin sebelum uh, menunggu pertanyaan yang lainnya, saya mau uh, eksplor lagi Ibu tentang uh, yang tadi minimal harusnya kan ada perjanjian minimal dua orang. Apakah ada konsekuensi ketika mendirikan PT itu tanpa perjanjian gitu? Karena satu orang bisa sekarang. Uh, belum masih di mute Bu. Ya, ya konsekuensinya kalau yang mestinya yang diambil kalau ini kan konsep dalam konteks omnibus law itu kan mengambil dari mestinya pasal itu yang dimasukkan ke situ disesuaikan dengan yang sudah ada dimanapun ini yang anehnya kenapa ya memang tujuannya mungkin untuk mempermudah ya tetapi itu justru tidak sesuai dengan hakikat dari adanya suatu pembentukan suatu badan usaha ya dalam konteks ini adalah badan hukum ya namanya PT pemegang saham di antara mereka harus melakukan sebuah kontrak perjanjian begitu, ya. Nah konsekuensinya kalau tidak memenuhi suatu ketentuan undang-undang secara formal kan mestinya batal itu, ya kan? Semacam itu, ibu. Berarti dalam sistem hukum sistem hukum kita terutama hukum persyaratan terbatas itu sebenarnya tidak bisa ya satu orang punya PT itu tidak bisa ya bu ya harus minimal dua gitu ya bu ya. Baik, terima kasih Ibu Sukarmi. So, is there any other questions? Kalau belum, mungkin saya ke Dr. Sony. Are you there? Or... Uh, yes, yes, I am here. <laughs> Because I cannot see your face. <laughs> it is only uh, yeah, the, it was the set... wallpaper. <laughs> Yeah, it was. Uh, now I'm setting it up because uh, we do multitasking. Therefore, I all right, all right. On, Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, I'm here. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so there is a question for you from Renga Kusuma Putra. Okay. Uh, so it is a question for you and Dr. Ali. 
uh, how is your views about reconstructions of the relations of the central and the local government? Uh, I think he is question is about is there any problems of the enactment of the job creation law uh, the problems of uh, the relations between central and local government are you having uh, any before, thought to okay. answer this yeah. let me just uh, give a very brief comment i think dr ali uh, safad will be answering but uh, as you uh, know, I'm uh, away uh, from uh, the center of the debate, but I just, I just have been following the uh, process, even though uh, from distance. So I just can give a general comment. Uh, Indonesia is a unitary uh, system, right? Adopts the unitary system. It's a republic, a Republican adopting unitary system, where uh, the... <clears throat> the concordance or the relationship between the central government and uh, provincial government is very, very important because they, the government is a centralistic in nature. It will be quite different from Malaysia, for example, which is a federal system where it, is, uh, comprises, it comprises of uh, 13 uh, different states which has different uh, governments uh, so the relationship somehow can be said that uh, in Malaysia, the relationship is loose, loose yeah, compared to uh, the one in Indonesia, which means everything or any law which is uh, initiated or which is legislated at the uh, central level will definitely have a very strong uh, effect or influence over the provincial government. That is in Indonesia. So I believe it is uh, a very important um, a prerequisite for any law to be passed in the parliament to ensure the smooth um, coordination as well as uh, collaborations between the, Fed, between the central government and the provincial governments. So I, I cannot go deeper into the Undang-Undang Cipta Kerja itself, but I suspect there could be lots of uh, inconsistencies between the interests of the uh, uh, central government and the interest at the provincial governments. That's my uh, comment to that question. Thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Sani. Uh, before going to Pali, uh, I'm asking you, is there any... Uh, political will or debate or issue that Malaysia will apply this kind of uh, law-making technique? Or it is just silence in Malaysia, there is no issue about it? Uh, as I said, practically and in reality, we have had experiences in the past where the uh, parliament had passed legislation which repeals uh, several laws at the same time and combined into one. We already have that experience. But interestingly, uh, there had not, had there hadn't been any you know uh, huge or or massive opposition to that uh, from Malaysian public, uh, but uh, there there had been always you know debates in the parliament on normal issue. But I think the reason is not because people in Malaysia are not aware, but rather because. Uh, those uh, omnibus legislation that we have had in the in in the past in Malaysia are considered, you know, less controversial. Uh, and in fact, this is according to the need. For example, we need a law which combine computing, broadcast, press, and many other similar industries into one. Of course, everyone needs that. Everyone needs that. So there is no controversy on that and also in other issues but if I imagine if similar if similar uh, bill like Undang Undang Cipta Kerja also is introduced in Malaysia I believe the same at least similar you know reaction as well as opposition will also take place because I cannot imagine you know having one uh, for 
amending 70 over 70 legislation and just now with uh, dr sukarmi ibu sukarmi just highlighted to us one of the example of the problem relating to uh, the the establishment of a company i think that is very uh, uh, disturbing situation yeah uh, so 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 that is my comment in in malaysia Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Sony. So now we are going to Dr. Ali Safaat. We still have um, like seven minutes before we close this um, agenda today. Okay. Concerning the local government, uh, to say whether the Job Creation Act is uh, tend to centralize uh, the authority or not, it's, we, we can see from three aspects. The first is whether this X uh, makes uh, the affair that's originally it's in the local government become the affair of the central government or not. And the second concerning the license, the uh, uh, in doing business, for example, in mining. And the third, it's concerning the spatial planning, the authority to create spatial planning. The first, it's concerning the affair of the local government. We can say that uh, the local government have the autonomy if any affair that decentralized uh, from the central government to the local government. Uh, in other words, the more decentralized affair, so the more the authority, the autonomy authority of the local government. And what kind of affair? In Indonesian uh, local government system, we have three kind of uh, affair. The general affair, that's all of the uh, level of government have the authority, have the responsibility, for example, uh, in keeping order of the society. And then the second, it's the central government absolute authority consists of five uh, sector, uh, monetary, security, uh, defense, uh, courts, and the other. And the last is concurrent affair. This uh, affair that can divide between central government and local government. This affair that decentralized from uh, central government to the local government. And in the Job Creation Act, even the affair already decentralized to the local government, but in minutes this affair, the local government have to obey, uh, this is the new instrument, the standard created by uh, the central government. And if the local government uh, disobey the standard created by the central government, this affair will centralize again to the central government. This is the first thing. The second concerning the license, uh, actually in doing business uh, for example for mining and other it's many uh, uh, doing business if you want to doing business in local government in job creation act you have to have license from the central government not from the local government anymore and the last is from spatial planning uh, one of the manifestation of the autonomy, if you have the planning, for example, in Malang, which area will uh, develop to become institution area, uh, educational area, which one to become a, a, a market area, which one to become a, a, the other area, for example, for, for, for the environment, uh, environmental area. But by this X, uh, the local government do not have anymore the authority to create a special planning. So how can the local government create the uh, autonomy, how they can apply the autonomy, how can they manage the affair without the authority to make a special planning? So, in the end, this is a kind of centralization. Uh, 
the local government do not have uh, autonomy that uh, they have based on the last uh, local government act. So this is a kind of centralization. Uh, the, cover, the central government have the full authority uh, to the local government and to the local development. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ali Safaat, Dr. Sony Zuluda, and Dr. Sukarmi for giving us a very magnificent talk on the recent debate of the omnibus law in Indonesia, particularly the omnibus law on the job creation. Um, even though we already have other types of omnibus law previously, as Pa Ali has taught us, but because of there is a controversy of the urgency and some substances and the process of the uh, enactments of the law, so then it is becoming so controversy now in Indonesia. So um, maybe that's all for our meeting today. Uh, we look forward to have another discussions, uh, maybe on another topics uh, of the recent development of law, whether uh, in Indonesia or in international aspect. Um, we say thank you very much for our guest lecture, uh, Dr. Sonny Zulhuda, uh, for sp uh, spending the time with us in these two hours and um, maybe in the future we will still also have other collaborations I see on your so, background the IAUM it is uh, the scenery is so beautiful yeah. and me and others lecturers uh, maybe are so delightful to come after the COVID uh, has finished uh, you are, of you course. are warmly and mostly welcome uh, actually, last year we we did uh, welcome uh, one delegate of students coming to our campus as a visitor. Right. So we All will right. welcome you again in future. All right. And thank so, you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Busukarmi and Pali. Thank you, sama -sama. Thank thank you, you very much, Sony. Sama -sama. Some years, some years ago, I will go to your university. Oh my God! Okay, good. Yeah. Thing. Uh, Hope we uh, can meet again. <laughs> Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> Right, maybe that's all for me uh, I'm sorry if have yeah, I, I have any mistakes in delivering as well as facilitating these discussions uh, thank you very much and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh have a good day, have a great day and wish you all the best terima kasih Bu Rizka sama -sama. I will send the certificate to your email All right. <laughs> Saya kagok manggilnya Bu Priska atau Mbak Priska soalnya masih kelihatan kayak mahasiswa. Yeah. <laughs> Baby <laughs> face. Sebenarnya sudah tua. Masyaallah. <laughs> Terima kasih. Thank you. Ya, yeah, Sukses acaranya. Terima kasih. Yeah. Waalaikumsalam. Pali Bu Sekarmi saya pamit ya. Yeah. Baik, okay. assalamualaikum. Salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Atur nuwun Bu Karmi. Sama-sama Mbak Bu.